thank you very much for your kind introduction and thank you for giving me a chance to speak on behalf of um, uh, Grey Squirrels and thank you for your attention to the subject. While on the subject of thanks, I would also like to thank our sponsors for this event, an online company called AF Nuts that sells nuts online in shells due to its impact, uh, good vegan protein, and also the Interactive Center for Scientific Research about squirrels, Peter Matthew. Um, so the reason grey squirrels would uh, particularly appreciate this platform if they communicated like this is uh, that their position in this country is ambiguous. On the one hand, they are intelligent, charming little animals, and many people enjoy watching them and feeding them even. On the other hand, they are not native to this country, conventionally speaking, more of this later. They were introduced from America in the 19th century, and um, for this reason alone, some people really dislike them and persecute them and kill them. It is unfortunately perfectly legal to do so because of their status as an introduced species. It is kind of open season all the year round. And the latest example of uh, this persecution is uh, a major volunteer drive by an environmental charity, the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts of all people, who are recruiting uh, 5,000 volunteers whose duties would include um, monitoring the population of their native red squirrel, but also trapping, transferring to a bag and bludgeoning to death grey squirrels whom they believe uh, to be partly responsible for the decline in red squirrel numbers, wrongly, I think, and I will try to explain uh, later why. So uh, what I would like to do today is, well, to first of all stay positive, and to begin with, um, I share with you some sound bites of information about grey squirrels, not of the, they have bushy tails, they weigh 500 grams, they eat nuts variety, but some things that caught my own imagination as I was reading up on um, various issues to do with uh, grey squirrels. And by the time I have finished that, it should become obvious why a spotlight should be shown on a certain paradigm in conservation. A paradigm being a kind of ideological framework into which facts are fed and out of which actions are taken that allows for the killing of some animals in the name of helping others, in the name of conservation, in the name of helping nature. This paradigm is distinct from science, though it often hides behind it. I also believe it to be anthropocentric, irrational and immoral. Sorry for the strong language, but I will substantiate, uh, I'll try to substantiate this uh, later. Um, there, there probably won't be much time for questions and comments at the end, but some. Well, I mean, I can see some really, really well-informed people in the audience. I'm very flattered by you being here. So it would be interesting to hear comments and questions afterwards. And generally, people who come to vegan festivals are pretty clued up. Yeah, so we, we can, if necessary, continue the, the discussion at the store. We have the store here as uh, Urban Squirrels at this event. Um, so, uh, sound bite number one, uh, the, the origins. Tree squirrels, the genus uh, Siurus, comprising nearly 30 species, originated in Eurasia. Then, nine million years ago, they migrated to America, where they diverged into several uh, local species. This colonization proved very successful, and several local species emerged from that process, such as the western grey squirrel, uh, the fox squirrel, and our friends eastern grey squirrels, who were brought back to Eurasia, to Great Britain, in the 19th century. The squirrels that stayed behind in Eurasia, red squirrels, are uh, very common over extremely large territory, from kind of Scandinavia to Siberia to Turkey. Wherever the habitat is suitable for them, they thrive. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case in Great Britain because of deforestation, because of habitat loss. They do um, struggle here. And my propaganda point in this is that all squirrels are native to Eurasia because that's where they originated as a genus. But anyway, um, before I go on to uh, soundbite number two, just a few words about references. The thing is, in the age of fake news, a referencing is no longer a kind of um, academic eccentricity, but more or less a need. When people are presented with um, what is claimed to be uh, facts, they should at least in principle be able to check it against uh, primary sources. So for instance, the reference for what I've just said about the origin of squirrels is this. I won't read them out, but I try to give out a handout with references and more, more here if you, if you don't have them. So basically, whenever I give you something as a fact, I should have a reference for it. When I give it as an opinion, I'm going to try to argue for it from general knowledge, from um, logic, from common sense. 
So soundbite number two, the housing. Uh, when it comes to housing, grey schools do not leave much to chance. They habitually use two or three or four drays or dens. And when one becomes damaged or uh, too dirty, even if babies are in residence, the squirrel can move herself and her babies if necessary to her second or third home. This is part of the reason why they're so successful. Soundbite number three, caching food. Well, squirrels uh, bury nuts, everybody knows that. And people used to think that they do it in a haphazard manner and forget where most of them are. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, squirrels don't forget. But also, before burying a nut, here are some of the things a gray squirrel has to consider. A, the calorific value of the food. Is the energy and calories of eating the nut in future going to be worth going to the place, uh, digging it out, opening it up? Um, B, um, how long is the food going to last in the ground without rotting? And in the case of acorns, the bit called the embryo has to be bitten so that the acorn does not germinate too quickly. C, pilfering. Is somebody else going to steal the food you bury? And in this case, is it worth burying the larger nuts further apart? You will spend more energy in getting to them, but at least if you lose them, at least you won't lose everything valuable at once. It's the, kind of the equivalent of investing your money in a diverse portfolio. And depredation. You don't want to be eaten yourself while you're busy burying your food. But a more dangerous place, a more open space perhaps, is going to be safer from potential thieves. And so the squirrel makes a decision, uh, guided by her intelligence and her instincts, and then a team of scientists with uh, reference books, supervisors, computer models confirm that her decision was indeed the optimum, the best, given all the above considerations. Next one is X-ray vision. Some of the acorns that grey squirrels pick up, well, red squirrels cannot digest acorns very well at all, but grey squirrels pick them up. Some of the acorns are infested with larvae of weevils. Such acorns uh, can be eaten by squirrels anyway, but not stored. And then without any visual clues, a squirrel can tell which, ac uh, which acorn has larvae in it and which doesn't. And this ability of theirs actually exceeds a researcher's ability to determine infestation with X-ray machines. The mechanism for this ability is unknown, although it is thought to be scent rather than um, actual sight, because the squirrel kind of shakes her head at the bad nut. But in any case, it works. Sound bite number five, breeding in accordance with predicted food availability. But this is a handry and squirrel, I just thought I'd show you the picture because it's cute. But we're talking about wild squirrels, and in the wild, squirrels can predict food availability and breed accordingly. Many trees display a pattern of producing seeds called masting, where an abundant crop in one year is followed by up to 10 years of poor crops. And this is nature's own way of keeping down the number of seed eaters, uh, squirrels among them. Um, and uh, do I have an ulterior motive in saying this? Yes, I do, because sometimes we hear that, oh, we have to cull squirrels, otherwise there'll be too many of them, we'll be knee-deep in squirrels. <laughs> well, the thing is, nature has its own way of keeping down the number of squirrels through food availability, even in the absence of predators. Which does not mean that baby squirrels starve to death, because squirrels can tell when food is going to be abundant and have more babies in those years, and more importantly, when food is going to be scarce and have fewer, if any, babies in um, those years. The mechanism for this predictive ability is again unknown, although it is thought that the uh, flower buds and the size of cones may be their cues. Soundbite number six is uh, um, communicating over the urban noise. Squirrels communicate both vocally with what sounds to us like clicks and screams and screeches, and non-vocally with uh, body language, tail flicking and flagging. And in the urban environment, grey squirrels, well, so forget, red squirrels don't live in cities, but grey squirrels have learned to rely much more on the non-vocal means of communication so they can still make themselves understood over the urban noise. And soundbite number seven is the cognitive skills of grey squirrels are truly remarkable. They are very intelligent little animals, as anybody who watched them for any length of time would know. Their cognitive skills have also attracted uh, researchers' attention. And in cognitive experiments, grey squirrels can problem solve, they can solve counterintuitive puzzles, they can tell colours, they can remember their strategy for a long time, they can change the strategy if an experiment is set up differently, they can learn from their mistakes. They can also open bottles and screw tops instantly. Um, grey squirrels also seem to possess the theory of mind. 
the theory of mind is the ability to determine what another creature is um, uh, thinking and adjust your behavior to that. In the past, it was attributed only to humans. Then it was um, begrudgingly granted to chimps. Now it looks like other animals have it also, including gray squirrels. Theory of mind manifests itself, most obviously, in the ability to deceive. And gray squirrels have been observed deceptively caching nuts. If a squirrel thinks that somebody, um, a, th a thief, is watching, she would make a big deal of uh, digging a hole, pushing something into it, covering it up, and then she runs off and buries the real nut somewhere else, while the uh, thief is busy examining the false cash. Um, so those were the sound bites. Um, but the really interesting thing is how um, these facts, and, and they're perfectly neutral facts from published peer-reviewed scientific papers, can feed into entirely different attitudes. Some people, like myself and others in Grey Squirrel Rescue, attitude number one, acknowledge these facts and think that squirrels are amazing animals and it's a great privilege to be able to help them. Whereas other people, like the publishers and some of the authors of this book, attitude number two, acknowledge exactly the same scientific facts, but come to the conclusion that squirrels are, or gray squirrels are, formidable enemies, and we need to work all the harder in order to destroy them, and we study them in order to be able to destroy them. Um, and so this, well, actually most of the uh, sound bites of information I gave you just now from a positive light, from attitude number one, actually come from this book. And you can tell both by the subtitle, Ecology and Management of an Invasive Species in Europe, and even by the kind of angle of the camera and image that the publishers are no friends of grey squirrels. The book does contain state-of-the-art research. But my point is exactly the same scientific facts can feed into diametrically opposed attitudes. Either grey squirrels are amazing and we help them, or grey squirrels are the enemy, all the more dangerous for being so clever. And so if we played kind of spot the difference with these two attitudes, the difference would not be in the science. Science does not tell us to kill squirrels. Science can or should inform our moral decision making, but it does not make the moral decisions for us. In a broader sense, science can, for example, give us the technology to build nuclear weapons, but it doesn't tell us to use them. Or science can um, give us cancer drugs, but it doesn't tell us whom to give them to when resources are scarce. Or science can calculate the cost of social care, but it wouldn't tell us who should pay for it, the relatives or the state. And in a narrow sense, science, yes, can tell us that, for instance, under, in, in certain habitats, gray squirrels have a competitive advantage over red squirrels. But it does not then tell us to maintain red squirrels artificially in that habitat, unsuitable habitat, while killing gray squirrels. This is moral decision making and it is done on a um, different level. There seems to be actually almost a tendency nowadays to put science in the position that religion occupied in the old days, as something that we would want to endorse what we were going to do anyway or something that would make moral decisions for us, so that we don't have to think for ourselves or struggle with uh, moral dilemmas. And so, to me, the, uh, the elephant in the room, or the giant squirrel in the room, if you prefer, is the conservation paradigm that allows for the killing of some animals in the name of uh, helping others. This is unfortunately a traditional conservation, and it is this paradigm that wildlife trusts follow when they recruit volunteers to kill grey squirrels. Um, as I said earlier, once again, forgive the strong language, but I do believe this paradigm to be anthropocentric, irrational, and immoral, They're not just empty themselves, I will consider them one by one. Anthropocentric means essentially human-centered. Just as the, this image centers on the squirrel, Acorn is his name, though the human is also in the picture, the conservation paradigm that I have an issue with centers on the human agenda, though the animals are also in their picture. Historically, this um, conservation started with people, for example, protecting trees, but for human use, for more efficient human use, or protecting beauty spots for the enjoyment of future human generations, or even protecting animals, but for hunting. In this country, for example, it would have started with gamekeepers looking after the, the land and the animals for, for hunters. Or in the 20th century, big game hunters in Africa, once again looking after the land and the animals, but in order to preserve their ghoulish playground in the best condition possible. 
This conservation may look after the ecosystem very well, especially if it is well informed and free from corruption, those are big ifs. Um, but the thing is, it does so entirely for the benefit of the human being without any consideration for the life and welfare of individual animals, only species at best. Then, historically, this conservation obviously did evolve, but only in the sense that it is not necessarily about hunting anymore. It is ostensibly about preserving and protecting nature, but in reality it is still the human beings who decide what is good for nature, so it still centers on the human agenda and thus remains anthropocentric. It is actually a kind of white man's burden, but in relation to nature. The, the poem I'm referring to, the, the White Man's Burden, is by the English poet Rudyard Kipling. It was written in the 19th century, and it called on the colonial powers to conquer and rule non-white peoples for their own good, because they cannot rule themselves and they need the benefits of civilization from the colonial powers. Well, now, a hundred years on, we're not even angry about this anymore. We kind of cringe at the arrogance of this call to take up the white man's burden. But the thing is, exactly the same arrogant attitude has now been transferred onto nature. We think that nature cannot preserve and protect itself, and we need to help it and manage it. For example, by artificially maintaining colonies of red squirrels in habitats that they are not suitable for, or that are not suitable for them, and that's with extensive captive breeding programs, relocations, reintroductions, supplementary feeding, etc., like a large zoo, while killing off any grey squirrels who happen to come near uh, that project. The buzzword of this is biodiversity. But in reality, simply the human being who decides which um, animals, which species belong in the ecosystem and which don't, and manage it accordingly. But the thing is, nature can manage itself very well if we just leave it to do its own thing. A rather stark example of this was provided by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. It happened about 30 years ago on the territory of the former Soviet Union, the, um, the reactor, the nuclear reactor affected, had to be encased in concrete and buried underground, and an exclusion zone was created around it, where the levels of radioactive contamination are so high that humans can never again live there. The scientists and journalists can go there for a short time, but this is it. Animals, however, did move into that exclusion zone and are thriving, both prey and predator species. And surely that is a humbling thought, that if we just leave nature alone, even in the worst possible condition, that of nuclear contamination, nature can still resurrect itself and uh, thrive and balance itself out. Well, actually, the levels of predation in that exclusion zone are seven times higher than in the comparable managed woodlands of Bielowieża nearby, so nature doesn't always balance itself out in the way we think it should, but balance itself out it does. The same point that nature is resilient and can resurrect itself um, and balance itself out is taken up by the award-winning uh, environmental journalist Fred Pierce in his book called The New Wild. The subtitle is Why Invasive Species Will Be Nature's Salvation. The author shows again and again by many examples how nature can resurrect itself, how it can even deal with the ecological mess we create in many cases using the very species that traditional conservation would deem invasive and alien and try to eliminate. So if you're interested in an alternative conservation paradigm, do read this book. I mean, it reads like a favorite Sunday newspaper, but buy it from Animal Aid rather than Amazon, so Animal Aid gets the profit. Um, and my point in this is that the conservation paradigm that allows for the killing of some animals in order to help others is anthropocentric because it centers on the human agenda and uh, assumes that humans always know best. It is also irrational because of the amount of emphasis it places on the whole native versus alien narrative, or well, the fact that grey squirrels were introduced from America in the 19th century. This emphasis is irrational because it is purely a question of fashion. In the 19th century, the fashion was the opposite. It was fashionable to collect animals and plants from all over the British Empire and to try to establish them on different continents. It was called acclimatization. And now, the pendulum of fashion has simply swung in the opposite direction. And as, at least as far as traditional conservation is concerned, alien introduced species are public enemy number one, 
and they are killed simply for not belonging here, even though they do no harm whatsoever and contribute to that very biodiversity that is such a buzzword nowadays. Well, uh, introduced species are regularly accused of all sorts of crimes against the ecosystem, but in many cases those accusations prove either false or hugely exaggerated when investigated properly. For example, grey squirrels are um, often accused of reducing the bird population. Now, it is true that squirrels, red and grey ones, are opportunistic feeders, and if they came across an unattended nest, they might take an egg. Uh, and that's what people see. But the thing is, they're not predators, and what they do is statistically negligible. And an extensive government-funded monitoring program has concluded that grey squirrels do not reduce the bird population overall uh, as a whole. The reference is in your handout, and it's, it's really about time we put that myth to rest. Another uh, story like that is that grey squirrels damage trees. Now, once again, it is true that grey and red squirrels do feed on trees. They eat twigs and leaves, and they can strip the bark in order to get to, to the sap, the jelly underneath. But this does not kill the tree, at least not in the vast majority of cases. It changes the physical appearance of the tree, but that is all. And the bark stripping actually encourages fungus and encourages insects, food for birds. Plus, if, uh, well, if the tree is already old and fragile, in the small number of cases when the bark stripping allows disease to get in and the tree dies, then it becomes a very valuable wildlife habitat in its own right, while the squirrel plants new trees. Which is why squirrels are known as some of nature's greatest conservationists. They regenerate forests. Even in commercial forestry, although that's a different case altogether, but even in commercial forestry, this accusation does not stand. Uh, the, the Forestry Commission conducted an investigation into grey squirrel damage, no doubt hoping to find another excuse to kill them, uh, but the damage was uh, found to be just 5%, of which is less than the damage due to poor growing practices, uh, such as lack of thinning. The reference is um, once again in your handout. But the queen of all accusations is that grey squirrels replace the native red. Now, that, that is quite a slippery one. So when we uh, hear or read in a scientific paper that grey squirrels are praised red squirrels, it is important to unpack exactly what we mean. Ecological replacement is a complicated issue. So if we mean, for example, that once upon a time there were lots of red squirrels and now there are lots of greys, or that in certain habitats grey squirrels have a competitive advantage over red squirrels, it is true. But if we mean that once upon a time there were lots of red squirrels and then the greys came and uh, fought them and killed them and pushed them out, it is false. The thing is, the red squirrels became very rare in this country to the point of extinction by the end of the 18th century. That was before grey squirrels were introduced and that was because of deforestation, because of habitat loss due to human activity, particularly in the Industrial Revolution. Because uh, the thing is, red squirrels need a very specific habitat in order to thrive. They're very habitat sensitive. They need extensive pine forests or equivalent and wildlife corridors. So when this habitat was no longer available to them, their numbers crashed. They were then reintroduced. Red squirrels were reintroduced from Scandinavia. So most of the red squirrels living in this country today are not native to Great Britain, but to Scandinavia, but by descent anyway. But in the meantime, grey squirrels were also introduced, and they proved to be far more adaptable. They um, can live in the conditions of deforestation that exist in this country. They can live with us in our cities. But instead of uh, being grateful that at least some squirrels have learned to live with us in our ecological mess, and, and after all, they perform exactly the same function within the ecosystem, we choose to persecute the species that has simply won the game of the survival of the fittest. And this is actually the original title of this talk was Squirrels Conservation and Six-Day Creation. Now, this is not a dig at evangelical Christianity, I'm a believer myself, but it just struck me uh, that just as six-day um, creationists would deny evolution with their words, traditional conservationists deny evolution with their actions by basically fighting against natural selection. And since thinking of the title as a bit of a joke, I read in all seriousness that the conceptual framework of native, alien, invasive predates the Darwinian theory, predates ecology, predates genetics. So what we're doing is that, well, we take 21st century science, state-of-the-art science, 
and push it into a pre-Darwinian philosophical framework, which is irrational. Just as it is irrational really to try to preserve red squirrels, a species that is not endangered, not rare in the rest of the world, their conservation status is least concern, in habitats that are, they are not adapted for, while killing off a species, gray squirrel, that is adapted for this habitat and well established within it. Now, if the maintenance of red squirrels is done by benign means, by establishing them on island uh, safe havens, for example, it is one thing. But if it is done by continuous cruelty to another species, it is a lot more morally questionable. Which brings me to, to the last part, the morality of our grey squirrel culls. The question here really is whether non-human animals deserve moral consideration. Because if we find that they do, then it follows automatically that culling them is a moral issue, since the taking of life is the, the biggest outrage you can commit against a, a creature. So do non-human animals deserve moral consideration, or is it just for humans? This question is um, often approached from the angle of why should they have moral consideration? I think it is more natural to approach it from the angle of why should they not have moral consideration? Because at the end of the day, it is normal to start a philosophical discussion from where most people are at, from agreed premises. And most people, well, if they saw someone kicking a puppy, for example, they wouldn't think, oh, this person is uh, damaging property or this person is displaying bad moral character. They would think this person is committing a moral outrage. And the reason we do put up with um, animal cruelty and animal suffering in uh, wildlife culls, in laboratories, in slaughterhouses, is because it happens out of sight. It is quite deliberately kept out of the public eye, so we're culturally desensitized to it, we're conditioned to accept it because we don't see it. Whereas if we saw it right in front of us, we would, well, react emotionally, first of all, we would feel sorry for the animal, but also intellectually we would remember that there is nothing, neurologically speaking, there is nothing distinctly human to the experience of pain, fear and suffering. An argument sometimes is presented here that uh, non-human animals do not understand what is happening to them or do not understand the context within which they suffer. Well, first of all, in many cases they do understand, but even if they didn't, for that there is the argument from marginal human cases. Babies don't understand what is happening to them, or people with dementia do not understand the context within which they might suffer, doesn't mean it's okay to kill them. Or ancient philosophers would, have, uh, would say, is it then okay to kill somebody in their sleep? They don't understand what is happening. Um, another concept that creeps into this discussion, and I think is quite dangerous, is uh, humane slaughter. Well, first of all, it's not even humane the way it is practiced in slaughterhouses, wildlife cows, or laboratories. Painless death is by lethal injection. But even if the death is painless, it still leaves unanswered the argument from foreclosed life opportunities. I'll try to explain what I mean. Well, most of us uh, would rather die painlessly rather than painfully, yes, but the overwhelming consideration is we don't want to die at all, at least not for a very long time. And if somebody does die before the age of, say, 70 or 80, there is that kind of feeling that they have missed out on some things in life and it's, it's very sad. And equally with non-human animals, if the death is early and unnatural, it does foreclose the life opportunities for that individual animal and it is therefore a moral issue. Well, animal ethics is, is a huge topic, too big for this uh, um, presentation really. So I will bring this to well, a bit of an <laughs> abrupt end. Uh, by saying that if you, if you do agree that uh, grey squirrel cows are anthropocentric, irrational and immoral, please consider taking the action. Um, you uh, could contact Red Squirrels United, which is a kind of umbrella group for the cows, and uh, complain. Um, if you put your complaint through the Animal Aid website, then your complaint is counted. Basically, Animal Aid is going to make sure your voice is heard. And it's, um, I mean, I would encourage you to do so if your conscience leads you that way. It's not just empty clicks or virtue signaling or whatever. It basically gives us real evidence in uh, correspondence and meetings when we try to prove that uh, race squirrel calls go against public morality. For more information, you can go to our website, Urban Squirrels, or the Animal Aid website. And there is also a Facebook group called Stop the Grey Squirrel Cull, which is kind of kept up to date uh, with campaign updates and whenever squirrels appear in the media, we put that on the Facebook page with a bit of a comment. So that's for the more up-to-date information. 
Um, we have, uh, oh no, we have a few minutes, uh, so uh, I'm just going to put up another picture of squirrels and uh, questions and comments would be very welcome. Is it just okay if I point out a couple of organisations that uh, kill and break squirrels? Royal Parks, as well as the deer. Um, I've got a few copies of a little that Natalia wrote about the general Royal Parks wildlife storage, federal lots of these to contact Royal Parks. Um, just let me know. Also, a few years ago, we went on holiday to St. Parks up north. Henry. They definitely they have a policy that if anyone saw a great squirrel, you're supposed to report it for them to call it. Mm -hmm. Try to keep just the reds there. No way of reporting any great mm -hmm. squirrels. So centre parks in Henry have a pro uh, great squirrel colour policy, so they're another organisation if anyone feels like that it's not an organisation. Rural parks and um, centre parks. <coughs> The National Trust also have a program. Validations, they have a lot of Well, the, the Royal Parks calls, yeah, they revealed the, um, the figures uh, as a response to um, a Freedom of Information request made by Animal Aid. The numbers are astonishing. As, yes, squirrels, yes, deer, pigeons, Canada geese, foxes, rabbits, you name it, lots of species and in very, very high numbers as well. And when we, um, Leslie campaigns regularly, and um, we hear from members of the public, oh, but they have to kill the old and the sick ones. What do you want them to do? Do you want them to suffer and die? And of course, the culls are absolutely not about that. Uh, huge numbers of animals are culled just, it seems to be just to preserve somebody's idea of what a park should look like. And there's no, well, I don't know if you know of any assessments of what the carrying capacity is, or the biological or the cultural carrying capacity of the parks what the numbers actually are, what the numbers are even targeted. Um, so it, it, it's a big mess, but the campaign is just in its infancy, I think, with the animal aid as well, it's, it's going to get bigger. Um, I have seen firsthand, actually, the damage which grade schools have done. I went to a college, and they were absolutely decimated the, the, the bird population regarding the nest boxes. I've got in 10 years I've been working there, and I've seen a, 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 uh, nest. Um, they seem to destroy everything, attack everything, and yeah. I've seen this first time. Uh, well, this is the, the nature of statistics. If I plant two trees in my garden and one is damaged by squirrels, I will say squirrels damage 50% of the trees. If I plant 100 trees and they damage one, I'll say it's 1%. So that's why when the Forestry Commission conducted the investigation, they had a particular methodology that is on their website, it's described in great detail, to give a national proper statistical picture of what goes on, because anecdotal evidence is precisely that, it's anecdotal evidence. Same for birds, yes, if you see a squirrel take an egg, obviously it's very distressing or damage a nest, but um, the, uh, the ornithologists and uh, the government funded this monitoring program that did a proper statistical analysis of uh, what gray squirrels do and the result was they do not reduce the bird population as a whole. Now a local situation obviously is statistically different. It's also different if squirrels are culled. It first of all it brings disease, the movement of animals brings disease, but it also um, encourages kind of agonistic behavior just as a dog that is abused will turn aggressive. So a squirrel that is culled or is witnessing culls or, uh, when they're kind of those disturbances within the population, they will um, become aggressive and destructive as a result of the stress as well. So it's, I mean, I can only give you the statistics, obviously, what people observe in their locality is, is different. Yeah, that lady you mentioned about parakeets. What, what is the situation? What's your views on that? Well, they're called in huge. Uh, they're called in huge numbers, like many other species, because they're well, not native, etc. Um, well, that's when uh, the kind of the history of dispersal is taken as a principle of what belongs here and what doesn't, rather than present ecological fitting. I mean, you could say, as to me, a rational position would be let's not bring exotic species, especially for the pet trade, into the country. But the ones that are already here, that are already established here, well leave them be, what can you do? They're here now. Are they doing any damage in the world? Not that I know, I think they just don't look right. <laughs> That's the, it seems to be the only kind of their own crime. Um, well,
related issue here, and it's something that I try to support in the time we're doing the campaign. So we really are looking for people who are interested in putting the word out, um, talking against some of the myths that are said around race girls, challenging the assumption that we should always be taking a conservationist cult perspective. So if anybody is interested in being part of that, I'd really ask you to um, either contact via the Urban School page or the Michael Scott the Urban School page. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you very much. Um, was there a question? Yeah. 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 Well, they seem to have done very well, <laughs> so that obviously they have adapted. But I suppose the bigger point here is do we dish out death because of how we want the ecosystem to be. My main point, I suppose, is ethical rather than scientific. Whatever the kind of the way the ecology balances itself out, our kind of interaction with it should be for the good rather than destroying somebody to help somebody else. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed.